welcome to the Actually You Can podcast. I'm Miff Galloway, a performance coach passionate about supporting ambitious and high-performing women just like you who know they have untapped potential just waiting to be unleashed. If you're looking to massively up-level your performance in all areas of life, you've come to the right place. My goal on this podcast is to take you beneath the surface so you can connect with yourself on a deeper level while providing you with valuable insights and the tools necessary to navigate life's challenges and go after your goals with strength, clarity, and wisdom. If you're ready to uncover the truth which lies underneath so you can recognize your powerful feminine leadership style, pursue your goals unapologetically, and thrive in every aspect of your life, hit the follow button and get ready to explore the incredible possibilities that lie within you. Together, we'll uncover your next steps in achieving peak performance, because actually, you can. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Actually You Can podcast. Today, I have the absolute pleasure of connecting with Barb Nangle, who is a boundaries coach, speaker, author, and the founder and CEO of Higher Power Coaching and Consulting. She's also a podcast host, and her podcast is called A Fragmented to Whole, Life Lessons from 12-Step Recovery. A little bit about Barb before we dive straight into the questions. In 2015, at the age of 52, after decades of therapy and tons of self-help work in a variety of areas, Barb got into 12-Step Recovery. She's been in two such fellowships since then and has changed deeply and profoundly as a result. As a former addict and people-pleasing rescuer, she empowers people to thrive and take more control over their personal and professional lives by coaching them to build healthy boundaries. She works with organizations as well as women entrepreneurs to avoid burnout and reduce turnover. Her speciality is working with professional women who say yes when they really want to say no and are so focused on others that they neglect themselves. And I know many of you listeners out here are sitting here nodding along going, man, that is me. And if so, you are not going to want to miss a minute of this episode. So without further ado, Barb, welcome to the show. It's so wonderful to have you here. Excellent. I'm so glad to be here, Meth. I can't wait to get this conversation started. I freaking love the name of your podcast because actually you can. I love that. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you. I so appreciate that. And I know probably the number one question on everyone's lips right now is why is it so freaking hard to set boundaries? And when it means hard, a lot of people either find find it challenging to confront people with a boundary or they feel guilty about setting one when they do. Why is it so flipping hard? Yeah, well, it's the feelings just like you're talking about. So sometimes it's shame, sometimes it's guilt, sometimes it's terror, sometimes it's fear of rejection or abandonment. But I think, you know, I don't I don't know Australian culture entirely, but I'm guessing that it's like the European kind of girls are supposed to be good and kind and say yes. Um, I had a client recently tell me she'd rather be called a whore than be called selfish. And we are acculturated to be selfless and to be self-sacrificing. So it's not that boundaries are difficult for men. They are. But I think it's so much worse for women because of patriarchy. Um, And this idea, like, I thought I was nice. I thought the reason that I was so helpful to people was that I was a nice person. And when I got into recovery and I learned that I was a people pleaser and that it was really about getting people's approval, I was shocked because here I was, 52, very introspective, tons of work, had no idea that was going on. And then I learned, like, I didn't know I was a people pleaser. I heard the term and I was like, not oh my god it's so me and then i learned that it's manipulative and dishonest to be a people pleaser so it's manipulative because we're going about our behavior for the express purpose of getting people to approve of us and whatever what for me it was i wanted them to think i was nice i wanted to to think i was helpful and um could be relied on and all that kind of stuff and it's also dishonest because we're saying yes to things we don't want to say yes to. We're saying we like things that we don't. Things are okay that they're not. We're saying I'm fine when we're not fine. And so what's interesting, Myth, is that what I did not want was for people to think I was a p- 
person. So here I was thinking, oh, I'm nice. Uh, I didn't want to be a bad person, but like if you listed qualities of a bad person, I'm guessing like manipulative and dishonest probably would make that list. So I was more, it's not that I didn't want to be helpful. Of course I did, but that doesn't explain where I went to the point where I lied and manipulated and then became resentful. Also forgot to say that part of people for taking advantage of me which it's not taking an advantage when you keep volunteering or when you train people, because we're always training people how to teach us, teaching people how to treat us. So I would be like, I cannot believe she just asked me for the 50th time to help her out. Well, guess what? She asked me 50 times because I said yes 49 times. So, you know, I've trained that person. So there's all these feelings and then there's these cultural expectations. And a lot of it was we have these misguided beliefs about what it means to be a good person, what it means to be a good partner, what it means to be a good mom or a good woman or a good employee or a good boss or a good manager or a good churchgoer or a good neighbor or a good volunteer, blah, 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 blah. So we have all these ideas in our heads. And, and then we've been taught that it is selfish to put yourself first. and and like it goes without saying that being selfish is bad and wrong. And that's like the worst thing that's worse than poor, you know. So, yeah, it's really hard for all of those reasons. But I'm living proof is that all that can change. Because I started building boundaries at 52 after decades of tons of personal development work. So it's possible to change and it's not. It's simple, but it's not easy. It's really hard because, and the reason it's hard is one, it's new, you know, any new behavior is, is hard, but two, because there's a lot of emotional work that goes along with it. You have to feel your feelings, you know, like I yeah. was, I was just burying my feelings and also way concerned, more concerned about other people's feelings. So a common thing I hear from clients is, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Now, I'm not advocating that you hurt people's feelings, but A, you've been hurting your feelings probably for decades. You get to be considered and the people whose feelings you don't want to hurt. And B, there's a difference between harming someone and hurting someone. So it, it might hurt you to use a needle to take a splinter out of your finger, but it's not going to harm you. In fact, mm. it's going to heal you. It might hurt someone's feelings to set a boundary with them, but it's not going to harm them. It might heal the relationship with them. And I say that because when you start setting boundaries with people who've been around, you're becoming honest with them about what's okay and what's not. Now, truth be told, there are some people who are absolutely not going to like that and it is not going to heal the relationship. Mm -hmm. And yes, you could lose people. That could happen. And that, that will be painful and it will suck. But the reality is they're not your people if they can't handle your limits and they will be out of the way so that your people can find you. And the, the thing is, it will absolutely heal your relationship with yourself because you've shown up for yourself and followed through for yourself in a way that perhaps you never have before. So I would say it's cultural expectations, um, limiting beliefs and not wanting to deal with feelings are the main reasons. I'm sure myself included, as in here going, yep, check, check, check. All those three things yeah. all at once. That's the um, reason why I struggle I with boundaries. I and I love how you mentioned, and I want to take right back to what you started talking about around people pleasing. What is your definition of people pleasing? And what was your like, oh shit, that's me moment? Um, so to me, people pleasing is that when we're doing something and it's much more about how they interpret your behavior than your actual behavior. So I was more invested in being seen as a nice person than being a nice person. And now, this was be below, this is subconscious. I, this was not in my awareness. And I am an introspective person, yeah. always have been, and 
always did tons of like I've taken every freaking personality assessment except for the Enneagram um, <laughs> out there. I've done all the things. And I was like, I had no idea. So here's here's what happened. This was the aha moment for me. So I'm in 12 step recovery a few weeks. And I say to this woman, OK, I'm starting to see that there's like this continuum of helpfulness where on one end, we've got kindly, helpful, healthy, functional behavior. On the other end, we've got dysfunctional, unhealthy, rescuing, fixing, saving, codependent, perhaps enabling behavior. And it's pretty clear the difference between those two ends of the continuum, right? It's in the middle, like where you flip over, like I'm lost. Like, how do you, like, what's, where do you switch from being helpful to being rescuing? And the woman said, you know, Barb, it really depends. Why are you doing it? Are you helping them to be helpful? Are you helping them because you want them to like you? And I was like, I'm totally doing it to be helpful. And that myth oh, percolated in my brain for a few days. And I was like, oh, oh my God. And it wasn't for me. It wasn't that they would like. It was that they would think that I was nice. They would think that I was helpful and that they would not think that I was a person. And to be a bad person. Mm -hmm says no and is unhelpful mm -hmm. and so what what that had that understanding helped me to be able to answer that question why am i doing it? but until i could see my motives that question helpful because at the beginning i was like she's not talking to me and yeah. now it's one of the guiding questions i use when i try to decide is this the right boundary for me because my right boundary might not be the same as your right boundary. Mm. So is this the right boundary for me? Or is this a healthy decision? For me? Maybe it's not around boundaries. What's my motive? Why am I doing yeah. this? So if it's a boundary, or is it like I'm going to help someone out? Am I helping them because I don't want to have the conversation? Am I helping them because... I really invested in what they think about me. Am I helping them because I truly have the bandwidth and really want to be helpful? Like there's a whole range of reasons. And I get to decide where the hell yeses are and the hell no's are yeah. and everything in between. And then the second question I ask myself that that guides me in these same things, what's the right boundary and what's healthy for me is, does this serve me and what i mean by that myth is does this serve my highest good does it bring me in alignment with my values because that's how i decide what my boundaries are and then me i'm a very spiritual person even though i swear like a mofo um <laughs> i does it bring me in alignment with my higher power and if the answer is no to those questions not doing it you know, I'm not. So here's what happened for me. This was the big shift for me to go from 50 something years of no boundaries to having such healthy boundaries that I'm now a coach that gets paid to train people how to build boundaries is that I made the shift from caring way more what other people thought of me to caring much more what I think of me. Now, this doesn't mean I don't care at all what other people think. Yeah. Of course I do. I'm a human former people. Yep. That's not going away, right? But what it means is that I used to be willing to throw my integrity out the window by saying, yes, mm -hmm. it's okay. And I don't mind. And sure, I'll do it. And I'm fine. I'm not willing to do that anymore. My honesty and my mm -hmm. integrity are so much more important than what you think. So if I'm going to do something to get someone's approval and I feel like shit about it, then I'm not so it's fine to seek mm -hmm. other people's approval, but only if you have your own approval first. So if you're going to do something and you feel good about it, go right ahead. But if you're going to do something and it feels like you're compromising your integrity, do not do it. Because no, there's no dollar amount or there's no anything that can get your integrity back. You are the one that has to do that. And there's nothing that's worth that. And so I think of it like this. I have my own approval now because I live in integrity. And so I don't need your approval. I used to like, like, let me claw and get your approval from you in whatever way I have to. And now I'm like, I want your approval, but I don't need it. You know, need it. 
uh, the way that I used to because I have my own approval. So one way that I think about this myth is, you know, again, it's totally outside of my awareness. I went to the world to get my needs met. It's essentially the <laughs> need for approval, right? Like validate me world. And so what I did to do that was like, I was like, I'm coming to the world from a place of lack. So I need something, which is approval. And then I'm also coming to the world from a place of lack because I'm completely drained because all of my focus is out there on you and what you're doing and thinking and seeing what does he need and what does she need and what do they need and what does the organization need and what does the cause need? And that's I'm focused on people, places, and things out there. And that's an endless drain on energy because I can't control that. And it's all going out that way. So I am not putting any energy in here where I can actually make a difference. So I'm drained. Mm -hmm. So I go to the world from a place of lack in two ways. One, I need you to fill my, my uh, affirmation cup, my validation cup. And two, I got no energy. And so now that I have healthy boundaries, I do things, I do more things that energize me and less things that don't energize me and that drain me. I pretty much don't do anything that drains me. And I also fill my cup first. So I heard, I don't know if you've ever heard of Ashley Kirkwood. She wrote the book, Speak Your Way to Cash. She's amazing. She says, don't pour from the cup, pour from the overflow. And the only way you can have overflow is if you fill your cup first. So it is not selfish to put yourself first. It's actually selfless because you have more to give. And who would you rather receive? Someone who is at their end of their rope from a totally empty cup or someone who is overflowing because they've taken really good care of themselves day to day. And I don't mean like I'm brushing my teeth and washing my hair and bathing self-care. Like that's maintenance, yeah. which by the way, I've been so depressed a number of times, I couldn't even do those things regularly. So if that's mm -hmm. you, I hear you. I know that that can happen. I'm talking about what fuels you. So what fuels yeah. me might not be what fuels you. For me, a lot of my self-care is conscious contact with my higher power. So I pray um, a lot, multiple times a day. I meditate twice a day, usually for half an hour each time. I journal. I have daily readers. I um, I say a lot of affirmations. I have a yoga routine. Um, I journal again in the evening. I have um, you know pictures and memes and stuff that I look at that that fuel me. I eat healthy, nutritious foods. I exercise and go. Out. I try to go outside every day. I don't necessarily, but um, you know. So those are and spending time with people that bring me joy. Um, you know, laughing, listening to music that brings me joy. Like those are the kind of things that fuel me, but what fuels you might be different. So that's what I mean. But like what fills your cup to overflowing? And so when I go to the world now, I go to give what I have to give. And because I've filled myself with love, I'm giving love to the world as opposed to trying to take, you know, affirmation and validation from the world. I read some t one time something about how we try to extract love from people who can't give it to us. I'm like, oh, oh, that was me. Like I was, I was going to people, especially like I'm a heterosexual woman. So I've dated men. All the men that I dated, I was like, gimme, 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 gimme. And when I got in recovery, I realized pattern, which I always thought was they were emotionally unavailable, which is true. But the real pattern was codependence. But yeah. what came to light in recovery also was not just that it was codependence, but the reason that I was attracted to these men and attractive to them is because I was emotionally unavailable. That was outside of my awareness. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is I knew that they were attracted to me, but I didn't understand that I was attracted to them because they were the problem. Here's another insight from my recovery. This blew my mind when it came into my awareness that I believed, again, totally subconscious. He, whoever he was, is responsible for all the bad things in our relationship. And I was responsible for all the good things in the relationship. 
like I I can't say that without laughing because it's ridiculous. Like there's no yeah. way that in any relationship, I, can't, I don't care who the two people are. There's no one person who is 100 percent of the time responsible for everything good and, and no one yeah. person that's 100 percent responsible for everything bad. So that's just like distorted thinking right there. I love what you mentioned. There's, there's so much to unpack here. But, well, one thing you mentioned in particular was people who are, are bad people, and I'm, I'm doing, like, air quotes here, mm-hmm. um, are dishonest, uh, don't act with integrity, and or, yeah, are inauthentic. A lot of the people who are quite uh, that I know who quite obviously have people-pleasing tendencies, you would think they're the most sweetest people around. Mm-hmm. But in reality, they're actually, to, again, to use the terminology, a, a bad person. Mm-hmm. And that in itself blew my mind. And I'm sure anyone who mm-hmm. considers themselves a people pleaser, if they looked at themselves through that lens, that would blow their mind as well. Yeah. And because I think you know, the flip side to that is you mentioned being selfish. And I, for a number of years, I was a professional um, athlete. And by nature of being a professional athlete, you do have to be selfish because your body is your machine and your vehicle mm-hmm. for, for doing well. And so people, <laughs> and my husband, bless, he would always be like, you know, you can be selfish. And I'm like, good. I'm glad I can be selfish. It means I can look after myself. Yeah, (laughs) I I can depend on myself. I can rely on myself. But I think we have such a negative connotation of the word selfish. And so on that note, I'm interested to hear, what's your interpretation of being selfish? What does that mean to you? Um, To me, selfish is someone who does not take anybody else into consideration ever. I think it's exceedingly rare for someone to be selfish. I think that that's like an epithet. It's used primarily against women. To control that, you know, wow. that's actually a really good point. I yeah. haven't actually heard of a man being called selfish before. Right. Holy now, shit. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I do want to, I do want to say something to those people who the lights yeah. have just come on for them, that there are people, these are in their manipulative and dishonest. You're not a horrible person. You are a damaged person. Like we typically don't have healthy boundaries because we grew up in some kind of dysfunction or trauma. Like I actually just today made a reel about here's the reasons that my clients tell me why they think they have problems. And every one of them comes down to trauma, abuse, dysfunction, family with no boundaries. Basically, you know, we grew up in dysfunction. And so it's not your fault, but you're responsible if you want your life to change. So you didn't cause it, but you get to heal it. And so this is what I want to say to you. This is info, not ammo. So this is information is that you're a manipulative people pleaser, rest, you know, person that lies and manipulates and that sort of thing. So this is info, not ammo. It's information for you to learn, integrate and grow from. It is not ammunition to beat yourself up. And I learned that in recovery. And I'll tell you something that I always felt like I had high self-esteem. I was shocked to learn when I got in recovery, like, oh my God, there was so, I didn't have self-worth. I did not love myself. I did not trust myself. That I knew. I knew I didn't trust myself. But what I, what I realized was I was almost like scanning the horizon at all times. Like, where can I beat myself up? Where where can I beat myself up? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that I was doing that. I didn't know that I catastrophized. I didn't know that I ruminated. And yet in my late twenties, I had done a lot of work on cleaning up negative self-talk. And as I've mentioned several times, very introspective person, tons of work. So all this stuff was going on inside. I didn't know that it was going on. So when I heard this info ammo, I was like, yeah. okay, I'm going to use this as information. In other words, let's be curious. Curiosity is wonderful because it's neutral. Mm-hmm. What's going on here? What might I do differently? How can I learn from this? Because if beating yourself up could turn you into a better person, you'd be perfect by now. I'm guessing if you're anything like I was. Beating yourself up, you end up battered and bruised. And that is no place from which to grow and change. So this is info, not ammo. And I have another concept I learned on a recovery podcast. I have no idea where that really helped me a lot. And it's the term flossum. F-L-A-W-E-S-O-M-E. So it's like you're flawed and awesome together. And what that helped that. me realize is that I, I mean, I still to this day have lots of black and white thinking that's, that's still coming undone. But I grew up with the idea 
then I'm not supposed to have flaws. And if I have them, well, I goddamn well better hide them, which meant I was super defensive all the time. I had all these masks up, trying to pretend that things were okay and that I liked things and that, oh, I can afford this. Yeah, I like what you like and all that kind of stuff. And so I was like, wait, I can be flawed. And also, they're not mutually exclusive. And so as I internalize that you know this took a while it didn't happen like that i was like okay so i started being okay with my flaws which meant i stopped being so judgmental of myself and then i started being more willing to share my flaws with other people which means being vulnerable with them which is what leads to intimacy and then as i stopped judging myself i stopped being so judgmental of other people and it was like wow this one concept like blew all that stuff open and really allowed me to just like relax in my life you know i have so much more freedom in so many ways in my life because i have healthy boundaries and that probably, if you don't really get what boundaries are, that probably sounds backwards to you. Because boundaries probably sound like jail. It's freedom. It's actually freedom. Because the way that I coach is I, I help my clients come up with their top five values. And then they use those. Yep. They're like guideposts. This tells me where and when to set boundaries so that I can promote and support what's important to me. So... I'll use health as an example. That's one most people can identify with, right? So um, in addition to being a codependent, I'm in recovery for compulsive overeating. I'm down over 100 pounds from my top weight. I am not an alcoholic, but I drank abusively until I was in my early 40s. I smoked bales of weed. I smoked cigarettes for many years. I was put myself in toxic situations, relationships, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I treated myself like shit. I abused and neglected myself. So my, my health really up there in terms of my values, because I don't just want to be healthy now going forward. I'd kind of like to make up for lost. And so it's really important to me. So I have financial boundaries in place to promote and support my health. So I pay for healthy, sometimes organic foods. Yeah. Um, I pay for things like yoga and meditation and all the things that go along i pay for things like you know exercise classes or to learn these different techniques and stuff like that i have time boundaries i set aside time in my life to prepare my food because i prepare 90 something percent of all the meals that i eat and i set aside time for exercise i make sure that i go to sleep and get about seven and a half hours of sleep every single so this is what I mean to say what's important to you. And then you use that as guides to determine when and where to set your boundaries. So, and here's the other thing that that does is that it helps. We talked about guilt and shame at the very beginning. It doesn't happen like this, but eventually as you start to set boundaries more and more in alignment with your values, you've gotten into integrity with yourself. And that integrity right there is the antidote to the guilt and shame that we often feel. Because we're focused on us and what's going on in here. And so, like, if you're going to judge me because I decline an invitation to grow, go to a brunch buffet on Sunday at 11 a.m. with you, go ahead. I'm taking care of my health. I don't eat at 11 yeah. o'clock. I eat at approximately 8 o'clock and 12 o'clock. I eat meals and snacks. I don't eat brunch. Buffet's not good for me. And I really try to do my socializing by things like maybe going out for coffee or a walk. Not so much. It doesn't mean that yeah. I'll ever socialize around meals, but it's rare. You know, and if yeah. you're going to judge me for that, I can live with that because I know that I'm protecting and promoting and supporting my health because I'm the only one who's going to do that. You're not going to do that for me. Clearly, if you're inviting me to go to a brunch at 11 o'clock on a buffet. I love what you mentioned about the focusing on values and I do similar with my clients as well. Um, my speciality is, is helping to set goals. And so we connect with values first and foremost to go, what goals do I want to set? Because people go, I don't know, okay. I think I want to do this. But in reality, it's, you know, societal's expectation or their mm -hmm. parents' expectation that they think they should do. So I love that values is also a really great resource for boundaries. Mm -hmm. And something you mentioned too around the feeling of 
guilt and shame and being judged. I think by nature of being human, we're always judging people to some degree. We're making conclusions and assumptions of people because that's what keeps us safe, right? Right. And I think people who take that judgment to the next level Mm -hmm. are really judging themselves a whole heap. Like I know someone who is very judgmental, but I know they are equally critical of themselves. And so I know personally, if I feel judged, I extend sympathy or or, or love to that person because I'm like, if you to judge me that harshly, Mm -hmm. I would hate to know how harshly you're judging yourself. Right. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, yeah. here's a, here's an insight that I got um, in terms of the judgmentalism is that, like you said, we have to make judgments. P- humans are judging discerning creatures. We have to see, like, we, we're basically focused on safety. Is this going to kill me? Like, is that really a saber through tiger or is that a kid? You know, so we have to make judgments. We're judging discerning tre- creatures. People are going to judge me. How about if I let them judge me for the actual me than some fake version? Ooh, I love right? that. They're because, gonna judge you anyway. Might as right, well judge it for you. Right. So you might as well judge the actual authentic me who says fuck all the time than the <laughs> girl that's pretending that she doesn't swear like a you know, a sailor. You know, yeah. and trying to act like I didn't really ever do that. Like I've never been able to hide the swearing thing. But there was many other ways in which I, you know, I pretended. Um, you know, it just doesn't work for me anymore. Like pretending is really draining yeah and I think I was reflecting back on a client I had last week in reality she was feeling really drained and flat and she's like I'm just unmotivated and to your point I got her to identify a list of her energy givers and her energy drainers and she was really quick to pull out all the things that she does that are energy drainers and I was like great so what what gives you energy and she was like oh shit um going to the gym (laughs) <laughs> and it was really hard for her to come up with the energy givers. But I love what, to your point, it's when you start to prioritize your energy givers, you find that the energy drainers sort of go off to the side, like they become right. less of a thing because right. you just don't have time for them. You're concentrating right. on the things that right. make you feel good well, as and opposed the, to keep spiraling yeah. on the things that make you feel bad. And the contrast is stark. Like when you start to feel like, oh, we, which is better, like by a thousand times, energy givers you know, not energy drainers. And then the other thing that happens, like I used to be attracted to and drawn to people who are takers and sometimes energy vampires. And I'm just not, I don't have it. Like I'm in recovery. So occasionally there are people like that, but I have boundaries. Like you're not getting a ride in the car. Like we're not getting close. Okay. I'll talk to you on the phone, but for 20 minutes, when I got in recovery, I would sometimes have like Three and a half hour conversations with people are five hours. No, 20 minutes. You got 20 minutes. And at 15 minutes, I'm like, listen, I only got five more minutes. I love that so much. That's that's my kind of conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to hear for someone who is on the fence about setting boundaries. If they're like, I, I kind of get it. It's still scaring the hell out of me. What would be your elevator pitch for setting boundaries? So I think like whenever people ask me anything, it's keep the focus on yourself because you can only control yourself. And some people are going to be like, no, I can't. Okay. You have the potential to control yourself. You have zero potential to control other people. So I want to give you some hints about how to keep the focus on yourself. So number one, ask yourself, what do I want or need in this situation? I literally never asked. So that was just not even on the radar. So what do I want or need here? In the beginning, you will not be able to do it. You will not be able to give it to yourselves. Just keep asking anyway. And eventually you'll do it and then you won't. You'll do it and you'll do it and you won't do it and then you will. And you'll and then eventually you'll just know what you need because eventually you'll get to know yourself better and you'll know and you won't need to ask. So what do I want or need? Second question, is this my business? I cannot tell you how frequently I say to my clients, and actually I just got off the phone with a sponsee from one of my programs. And I was like, it's not your fucking business. Your son gets to raise his children however he wants. It's none of your business. So I gave lots of unsolicited advice. I I like leapt in to help people. Sometimes when they didn't even think of their situation as requiring help. So I'm basically, you're incompetent. Let me do this for you. So is it really your business? And I can see my, I'm in the first and only healthy romantic relationship ever. And I can see 
oh my God, how I was so in the business of the people that I dated. That was none of my business. Like, for example, anything going on in their house. I don't live there. None of my business. Um, third question. The way that we say this in recovery is what's my part? That might sound a little harsh to some people, but what it means is like, what could I do differently? So if you're experiencing the same dynamic over and over in your life, especially if it happens in multiple areas and multiple relationships in your life, I have news for you. You are the common denominator. And so this is info, not ammo. So we're not going to beat ourselves up. We're going to use it as info, not ammo. And say, okay, what's my part here? What am I doing to contribute to this situation? And therefore, what could I do differently? Because if you're experiencing the same dynamic over and over again, then you get to, to change it's the way that you're interacting with other people. And then another way to keep the focus on yourself is to ask yourself, like, whose feelings are these? So am I managing other people's feelings like if I think is it my job to make you happy and to make you feel better and to cheer you up like people get to be upset if someone is grieving mm -hmm. please allow them to grieve yes bloody you know? ice. and 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 um you know it's if somebody wants to be cheered up go ahead right but I and I actually just remembered something I forgot to say about the is this my business thing like it's fine to help people please get their consent please 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 Yes. Get their consent. So things like, are you looking for help or are you just venting? Or, uh, you know, I have some suggestions. Would you like to hear them? Or I've been through something similar. Would it be helpful for you to hear what I did? You know, but better yet, wait just on that. ask you, you know? Yeah, on that. It's really funny you mentioned that because I think that's something I see on social media all the time, like uh, jokes about men at communicating with women going, you know, do they just want to vent or do they want help? Because men are apparently always trying to fix things. But it's funny because I think women could really benefit from asking that question themselves yes. and to others as well going, hey, yes. do you actually yeah. need help or do you just want to talk? <laughs> yeah. And then the last yeah. way to keep the focus on yourself is to take really good self-care, which I've talked about, you know, already. Like it is not selfish to take care of yourself. And actually, I want to give you, I want to share something with you. This happened for a client of mine a few weeks ago. So I don't know if it happened all over the world, but in the United States, there was some fiasco that had to do with the internet that wrecked the yep. air flights all over the place. Yep. Well, one of my clients too. <laughs> is an event. And so her event was a basketball tournament with kids from all over the country. And they were at the tournament when the shit hit the fan. So all of the flights had to be redirected and she's in charge of taking care of that. So she gets home from the trip. She messages me. She tells me this is what happened. And she goes, I am so proud of myself for how well I handled this. Self-care was key. And I said, you know, it's amazing what you can withstand when you take really good care of yourself. And I had never said it like that before. I'm like, oh, yes, it's amazing what you can withstand. Because your stress level is so, so down low that when a stressful event happens, you don't lose it because you're continually filling your cup. So she was pouring from the overflow when she had to rearrange those flights for those, I don't even know, I'm probably hundreds of kids. I don't really know the number, but I'm guessing if it's a basketball tournament, it's probably hundreds of kids. What a night. But it wasn't a nightmare for her. She was like, this is what's happening. And also, this is my job. I'm the best person yeah. to do this. You yeah. know? And I've put myself in a really great position to do my best work because I've prioritized right. self-care. I love that so much. Yeah. And so you provided such incredible insights and already have a multitude of great tips, which I've noted down myself. <laughs> uh, but I'd love to hear what's a really actionable step the listeners can do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start setting their first boundary. Um, I think I'm just going to go back to keep the focus on yourself. Like you have to know what you want, right? And you can't know what you want with your focus on other people. And so yeah. Like that's something people say to me all the time. Well, I don't, I don't know what my boundaries are. I don't know what I want. Well, part of the process of building boundaries is that discernment. Like, what do I want? So ask yourself, like, keep the focus on yourself. What do I want here? You know, often yeah. when I, when I back things up, what I want is probably 
peace. Yeah. Right. And I yeah. am the only one that's going to give me peace. You're not going to come into my house and lob a bunch of peace at me. Right. <laughs> like I have to protect my peace, you know, but maybe that's not what you want. But, you know, ask yourself, like, what do I want? Um, what I talk about is powered communication. Some people use the term assertive. You know, it's just like, I guess it's probably the same thing. But you want to be more like people think it's rude to be directive and say, please don't do that. Or can you put that there? Like, does that sound mean when I say that like that to you? No, but they feel mean when they say things like, please don't do that. Or can you put that there? As opposed to, um, hey, would you mind, would it be okay if the next time that you do this, that maybe you might consider, like, how much energy is it taking me to? to go through all those hoops I'm trying to jump through than to say, please put that there. Hello. And especially uh, most people just want to do a good job and right. for you to be happy. I would right. much rather someone go, hey, put that there as yeah. a, and know yeah. that I put it in the right place or, yeah. hey, what do you want for dinner? Oh, I don't mind whatever you want. Like, like no, if there's something that you want for dinner, let me know because I want yeah. you to be happy too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But on your end, you could say you can have A or B for dinner. You know, so give them just yeah. a couple of options instead of what it, and the universe includes. What do you want? You know, <laughs> and it's, that's a boundary setting technique is to give people options. You know, I options. call it naming the terms of the engagement and people are much more li Ooh. likely to choose one of the options. It's like kids. You don't go, what color shorts do you want to wear? You're like, do you want the blue oh. shorts or the red shorts? Right. Because they have some autonomy. <laughs> have the they feel like they're making choices, but they're not like. From the rainbow of colors of shorts, which ones do you want? You know, it's the same thing with adults. It makes things easier for us. It goes stir. You know, like there, we waste so much time by people pleasing with other people, we, and which means we're wasting energy. Yeah. Like also adults are just big kids too. So there's of a lot course. of times where I'm like, we yeah. just went back to, to yeah. treating ourselves like kids and having fun like kids right. do. Not and creating structure. Like yeah. Uh, yes. Hundred percent. I completely agree. Like I have quite a lot of structure in my life and discipline, and people go, "Oh, it sounds so restrictive." I'm like, "No, it's actually freeing for me because I know exactly what I need to do at what point in time. I don't waste energy around any of that. I'm with you. And I find I have a lot more free time. So mm -hmm. yeah, I completely yeah. appreciate. Yeah. That as well. Do you know um, the book Discipline Equals Freedom by Jocko Willing? He was. Yes. One of, he, yes, yeah. <laughs> so like, I I can't even believe I read that book because it's so like really like me but it's a really fantastic <laughs> book and i like a food plan is a really good example so again i'm in recovery from right. multiple readings so I, for me personally i weigh and measure my food yep. um but having a food plan like i know when i'm done eating i know what's enough not because my stomach tells me or my feelings tell me but because my brain and my measuring cups and my scale tell me and mass tells me you know, and so it's freeing. And for me, it's freeing because I played a lot of games. Like when I started in my recovery program, I didn't weigh and measure everything. And I actually chose to weigh and measure everything except vegetables because I'm never going to overeat them because I yeah. played these games with myself. Like, was that really four and two? You know, was that really a cup? You know, like I yeah. probably could have like, ah, no, game over. Like there's no more games in my head. And so I get to actually concentrate on my life and the people in my life as opposed to obsessing about food all the time. So for me to have discipline around my food gives me a ton of freedom in my life. I love that so much. Well, thank you so much, Barb, for the chat today. I've had an absolute ball. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. And if the listeners are looking to learn more about the incredible work that you do, where can they find out more about you? So go to Boundaries Starter Kit dot com so I, I don't not sure when this is going to be a release but it's going to be out in the next couple of weeks but even if it's not ready yet you'll be on the waiting list so this is i'm so proud of this it's entirely free and it in the videos uh my podcast playlist with 35 episodes just about boundaries and it's an evergreen playlist so when i add more podcast episodes about boundaries they will add to it um, two worksheets and an article. And if that does not get you started on your boundary building journey, I don't know what is. So that's the best place to go. But on social media, 
My favorite places to hang out are on Instagram at Higher Power Coaching. And then I'm really starting to like LinkedIn a lot too. I'm at Barb Mangle. So that's N like neighbor, A N G L E. And then, of course, because you're already listening to a podcast, you can hop on over to my podcast on the same, which is Fragmented to Whole Life Lessons from 12 Step Recovery. Or if maybe you're driving and you don't have time, you can't. Go to that right now. Go to fragmentedtohole.com and it'll take you to my podcast. Amazing. And I'll put all of those resources in the show notes. I look forward to seeing that starter kit. I think that will be an incredible resource. I'm, and you made I it. I can't free, tell you how which is exciting. ridiculous. I'm so excited about it. I really am. I feel I'm super proud of it. I literally took a picture of myself after I finished doing it because I was so jazzed. I'm like, I don't want to remember this feeling of accomplishment. <laughs> I love that so much. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Barb. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. You too. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. I hope this was helpful. If you thought of someone while listening to this podcast, I would be so grateful if you could share this episode with them. While you're doing that, please also take a moment to leave a review on the podcast if you haven't yet already. It takes less than a minute and it means so much to me and helps this podcast to reach more people just like you. Thank you so much for that and I'll see you in the next episode. In the meantime, go out and achieve every dream you have because actually, you can.